The lyrics to this song, written by Hannah Senesh, an Israeli poet and World War II war hero. In February 1943, before enlisting in the British Army, she was living on Kibbutz Sedot Yam. She wrote this Hebrew poem. There are stars whose light reaches us only after they themselves are cold and gone. There are people whose radiant memory lights the world after they are no longer among us. These lights, shining in the darkest night, are what show us the way.
Hi, Danny and Jeff, good of you to, to join us in this crazy time when we can't really sing together in the same place, but at least we can talk about music. Uh, and you guys have created some wonderful music. Uh, um, we're talking now about beautiful song, Yesh Kochavim, a song of remembrance. And first thing I wanna ask you is, is, when did you write this song and what was the impetus to write it? Um, I was in Israel in 1981, and I was uh, in residence at the Leo Beck High School in Haifa. And um, part of my job was to lead singing every Shabbat. So they had a beautiful sanctuary on the campus of uh, the Leo Beck High School overlooking the Mediterranean. And every Friday night, we would gather I mean, only in Israel can you do this. We would sit in a circle on the courtyard outside the synagogue, overlooking the Mediterranean, watching the sunset, and singing uh, Kabbalat Shabbat. As an introduction to the Mourner's Kaddish was this prayer. And week after week, we would recite, Yesh Kochavim, Sheoram Magia Artsa, by Senesh. I took out my guitar. And um, as I do quite often when I find a text that I can't shake, where the words just kind of spin around my brain, I started to compose a song. Hey, there's a, there's a um, liturgical interesting point here. One of the, the, uh, the hallmarks of all the liberal prayer books since, since the 1850s is that uh, the transition from... Um, Bayom Hahu, from, from Aleinu and Bayom Hahu, into Kaddish, always had an introductory memorial reading to set the tone for the mourner's Kaddish. And um, so there were some in German, there were the Union Prayer Book of 1895, had stuff in English. The Israelis picked this up. They picked, however, Israeli poetry, meaning Chana Senesh's Yesh Kuchavim, as their mood-setting piece before Kaddish at the, at the end of the service. So there, there's uh, this is an interesting story of how Israeli progressive Judaism influenced North American progressive Judaism. And it's, um, it's a bit of a circular piece. So Jeff falls in love with this text and writes a melody. Several years later, uh, Jeff and I together create a translation of it. Don't forget, this is the 1980s. Debbie Friedman has written Lechi Lach and is experimenting with Hebrew and English. Um, mm -hmm. In, in, in the same piece of, the Barach, of course and, um, and and so we create an English translation and it's for various reasons this is at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic um, it became a, a widely used within the reform movement and in the uh, 1990s when we when the reform movement was creating a new prayer book um, the song was so widely used that the editor chose to include it as, as one of the, the readings before, before Kaddish uh, in, in Mishkan Tefillah, in the Reform Movement's current prayer book. So it's a, it's a, uh, a journey that Jeff started in 1981-82 that ends up being, be, sort of became being canonized, if you will. Not the melody, but the words in, as, as, as ongoing ritual, as, as lit liturgy, not just poetry, by 2007. So let, let's talk about the lyrics uh, a little bit, uh, what they mean, what they mean to you, um, how they have uh, jumped across the years, if you will. To me, <laughs> like the most emotional song. We, uh, I remember singing it publicly for the first time well, in Kansas City in 1989, or, yeah, 
my, my brother died of AIDS in um, January of uh, 87. And we created an English translation and then we started doing uh, concerts to raise money for AIDS causes in 89 and um, wrote this Eng English version to go with it and started singing it in Hebrew and English. And then some people started arranging it. So by, by um, 89, 90, and we sang it in New Orleans at a biennial in 1989 when we carried in the, um, oh, the, the, quilt. Quilt, the quilt pieces. Um, of, of uh, several hundred people who had died of AIDS, including my brother, and I still have that quilt piece, um, you know, a picture of it. But we and we walked in down the aisle of thousands of people singing with the with the uh, singing recording of Yeshko Chavim. I don't remember if it was live or not, but it became very associated with personal memories of, of uh, ones you loved. And so uh, I, you know, for me, it is when I'm in um, any morning. Piece or, or planning a funeral or a memorial, um, it's a perfect piece because the words are, are extraordinary. Um, you know, as, as, as Jeff taught me in, in uh, Rachel's article, that um, human beings are, are like stars and that they're always there. They just, we, we don't see them the same way. Um, it's, that's a very comforting um, as a mourner, it's a very comforting thought. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 for, for me, um, I, I first connected it with my, with my brother's death. Um, and uh, then two or three years later, my daughter was died, named for him. And uh, last year, she passed away. Yeah. And at the, um, at the funeral, that was, this was the music that was sung. So it's, uh, um, it's powerful in that it had it, it evokes for each person personal memories. Yeah. Um, it's not about any one person. It's about life. Mm -hmm. Well, each of us has a different way of of thinking, of course, and responding to 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 life and 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 to art and. Some of us hear music and it touches us viscerally because of the music and the meaning imbued in the music. Of course, that's personal for each, each individual. And some respond more to the meaning of the text. I don't know if you want to call that a left brain, right brain dichotomy or, or whatever. Uh, for me as a composer, even before I know the meaning of a text, I'll always understand something of what's going on. But the sound of the words themselves are so lush and rich. Yesh, yeah, the sh, yesh kohavim, and then the the, the r sound, shoram magia artsa, raka asher hematz mam avdu venam. It just has a beautiful flow. And as I did some research, I realized that Hannah Senesh, who wrote a great deal of poetry, she kept a series of, of uh, journals, notebooks that were found after her death, um, did not write this particular song or poem as a poem. It came from a letter that she wrote to her family. She had escaped Hungary. Um, before the Nazis came in, very shortly before the Nazis came into Hungary, near the end of World War II. And she had been living on a moshav located near the beach in Israel, near a town called Caesarea, which is why her most famous song, Eli, Eli, Shalom Yigamer Leolam, is called Walking in Caesarea. Oh, they call it Caesarea, right. The title of it, and she would walk on the beach and take in the beautiful vista and the sounds, and she wrote many of her feelings into her books of poetry. But the, the verse that we're talking about now came from a letter 
that she had written perhaps to her mother or to another relative upon hearing that a relative of hers had passed away in Hungary and she had to mourn from Israel. Of course, she could not go home. She tried with very tragic consequences, but that's a whole other story of her life. So, you know, this song is, is mournful and yet uplifting at the same time. Um, from a musical point of view, we've been talking about the lyrics and, and, and what they mean and, and the evocation of lyrics, but what, what is the secret? What makes a song so successful that it can, that it can touch you uh, and, and not totally bring you down, but, but bring you up? Um, at the time, 1981, I had, it was the first time I spent time out of the country, out of the United States. And my diet of music, my, my musical taste ran towards contemporary folk music and folk rock, which at that time was very heavily influenced by James Taylor. Unfortunately, not Jewish, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm an equal opportunity Honorary. listener. So, so when I am improvising on guitar, quite often, maybe not so much today, but at that time, what came out was kind of James Taylor light flavored by that. And so, so the, the initial attempt came, came out in that kind of almost naive, folky flavor. And but it was a, only through the transition line, though. Yes. Orot ele hamav hikim. Orot ele hamav hikim. Da 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 da. And then it goes into a chorus that everyone can sing. A kind of a chorale. Shemarim la adam et haderech et haderech. Almost like a slow march. Yeah. And it's interesting that it's it's not in a minor key. No, but it's the setup for the Nechemta, and the Nechemta is, is, is the consoling piece, is uh, as we live our days, these are the ways we remember. Heim, heim, shemarim, la adam et haderech. These yeah. are the ones that show us the way. And that's a very positive message, which is why it's in major. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the transition line is really crucial. Having poetic license, and songwriters do this all the time, we play games, we switch words around, we repeat mm -hmm. words, we leave a word out. Occasionally, we repeat words. But Hannah Senesh wrote, Haim, you know, these stars, Haim, Haim, those, those. She wrote it twice. Haim, Haim, Shemarim, the very ones. And I just took advantage of her, her poetic instinct, mm -hmm. and, and, and wove that into the song. But um, more to the point in terms of the style, once I had a kind of a, just a basic outline of the song with the chords, then I went over and over and over it. And the song, I wrote a lot of music in Israel, and much of it was influenced by the music of, of Israel which I was listening to nonstop because I was there. And, and those were the, the glory days of um, great, great musicians like Ari Einstein and uh, Yehudit Ravitz and the songwriting of Naomi Shemer. The, the way the song came out, and I'm talking to two musicians and we're broadcasting to many people who are musicians, we sometimes don't have control over what comes out. It just comes out. Mm -hmm. So something is imbued in that song. I would like to think it's the spirit of the lyric. Take a moment and I mean, the other songs that you guys have composed, I'm thinking of Shalom Rav and Moda Ani, obviously a very different kind of song. Uh, how do you how do you differentiate uh, this with with its meaningful lyrics and how do you think of it uh, how did you think of it being received? So many so many of our songs were written 
specifically for uh, groups to sing. The, the intention was that everyone would sing everything. <clears throat> and this is one of those songs that is uh, like a, a, a solo chorus song. Um, while it's possible, I mean, it's lyrical enough, it's easy enough for a full group to sing, um, and it's a good choral piece, it's, it's, it's best when people have to listen to the words at the beginning, then they can, uh, their emotions can come out with the chorus, with the yish, hem hem shemarim la dama taderech. But that's very different than the rest of our songs where the intentionality was get the group to sing. Uh, here we wanted to get the group to listen and to feel. You know, we talked, when we talked about Shalom Rav, we talked about how important it was for us to help people understand the meaning of the Hebrew text. This is poetry, and, um, and it wasn't liturgical initially. So I, 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 and also I was heavily influenced by Debbie's Misha Berach and, and Lechilach, um, where, she, where the power of the English text um, told the listener, or told the sin, what the emotion should be. I mean, we're English speakers. So I, I also knew that, that um, if we wanted it to be used in a, uh, in a sidur on an ongoing basis as a, uh, a piece of liturgy, it needed to be in English. Um, oh, and and, and our, our Kiddush was to do both Hebrew and English in the same song. But um, the, 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 in, in, the, in the reform liberal tradition, the setup for the Kaddish is always in the vernacular to explicitly um, evoke memory and evoke emotion. So um, if we wanted it to be used there, they had to be English with it. And what was it like to write a translation that had to be singable? Obviously, it's not going to be word for word. You wanted to keep the, the spirit of the piece, the overall meaning of it, but then it had to had to work into the same uh, rhythmic values as, as the Hebrew words. Uh, how did that go for you? It's not fun. easy. Yeah. It's not easy to craft poetic English uh, that's not original. Right. We're not English poets <clears throat> writing something new and perhaps writing the music and the words at the same time. We're trying to overlay English onto Hebrew, and they're very different languages, and they sound very different. They go in different directions. Um, it it takes microscopic tweaking, just a word, a syllable, to to find the right the right idea. Because of course, your the ear is going to hear the vowels and consonants and the rhythm, and your cognitive brain is going to process the meaning of the of the English. But you also need the courage at a certain point to say, uh, I can't do a literal translation. I want to be as close to the Hebrew as possible, but it's just not going to work rhythmically. It's not going to work emotionally. The classic line here is the Hebrew is heim heim shemarim la adam et derech, and we couldn't figure out how to make that line work. We can probably have tapes of us playing with it. And we ended up with, yeah. as we live our days, these are the ways we remember, which rhythmically is the same, but um, is not a translation of the text. As Dan said, it, it's not a literal translation of the Hebrew, but it's meant to capture the feeling of the Hebrew. Um, if you scan the English verse, which I'm looking at, right now um almost every line has a word meaning bright or light there are stars up above so far away we only see their light long after the star itself is gone then a line that takes a different approach and so it is with people that we loved Metaphor. their memories keep shining ever brightly though their time with us is done, but the stars that light up, and now you have the opposite, the darkest night, these are the lights that guide us. And of course, you have that great image of a, almost a spotlight that, that we are all being followed, uh, perhaps by, by a 
mysterious light. Interpret that however you wish. Uh, to wrap up, what do you think this song's message is to us in these difficult times in which we are living today? Uh, to me, it's a reminder of uh, brighter times in life. Uh, I'm, I'm spending my uh, COVID quarantine in the Berkshires, and when we get clear, dry nights and the sky fills up with mm. stars, uh, you look at how much is going on up there and you think about um, moments in your life, positive moments in your life, people, places, things, um, and they're just bright and sparkly and positive, and they're still there shining. Um, it's, a, it's a literal, it's literally the song um, outside my window or up in the sky. That's extraordinarily comforting. Um, and it, it pulls me out of moments of, of, of sadness and depression. And, and, and it's like, you know, how do you make lemonade out of lemons? And this is a period of lemonade of lemons in our lives. And, uh, but to remember what we did a year ago or five years ago or 50 years ago, um, you know, we don't know what the future is going to be anymore. <laughs> it's so unpredictable. But we do know what our past is and we can take some joy uh, and comfort in, in remembering um, the good moments, all the wonderful stuff that we have done so far with full uh, assurance that there will be more. We just don't know what they'll be. Humankind will never be bored looking at the sky. The more you think about it, the more your brain just gets wrapped up because how can we possibly deal with, with the cosmos? It, the, well, how can we deal? A scientist will <laughs> tell you about and the mathematical of, uh, formulas, you know, and, and composition of stars and stardust and w the, what's in it. But the poet revels in, in that beauty, which can almost not even be expressed or explained. In the chutzpah of, of three of us having these conversations, um, saying, oh, you know, what, what smart things we're thinking of. And you realize the billions and billions of conversations out there that are taking place that, are, that we don't know anything about and are probably far more sophisticated than we'll ever be. Uh, that's what stars do for me. It's not